Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedicase. I've got a couple degrees in theology and I'm working on another in philosophy of religion. And throughout my time uh, in all my studies, I've had some really amazing conversations with fantastic, brilliant people. But unfortunately, all those conversations are just up here or lost to the sands of time. So the goal of this podcast then is to have the same conversations, to record them, and then to share them with you so that you get to learn as I learn. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. In this episode, uh, we're going to be talking with Dr. Ryan Mullins. And again, this this podcast is about philosophy, theology, nature, and life. This one's going to be a little bit more about life. It's going to be about Ryan's life and his life almost becoming a ghost writer, ghost writer for uh, Mark Driscoll at Mars Hill. So we're going to be getting into that and then talking a little bit about his theology and how it's progressed uh, throughout the time, uh, throughout his time studying going to be fun. So if, if you're not as interested in Mars Hill type stuff, but you love Ryan Mullins, you're going to love it. If you don't know who Ryan Mullins is, well, you have to. So watch this. And uh, if you're interested in all the Mars Hill gossip, we're not going to be gossiping too much or anything like that. But I know it's spicy. I know you like to hear some Mars Hill stuff. So pay attention or stay tuned for that as well. Before we jump in, uh, I just want to thank everyone over on Patreon for making this happen. You guys are awesome. If you like this podcast, if this is your favorite podcast, if you benefited from this podcast, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find a link in the description wherever you're getting this at. You can join for a bunch of different amounts uh, a month, and there's all different prizes and goodies over there for you. Uh, you can also join our Facebook group, Parker's Pensies Ponsiers. I'm not saying any of that right, but uh, if you can find the Facebook group through what I've just said, then I'll let you in and we can talk with a lot of the guests like, like Ryan. Um, that'd be great. And that's enough of promoting and all that stuff. I probably got more, but who cares? Um, so without further ado, let's jump right in. Ryan, dude, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. Yeah, no problem. I was, when I was chatting with my wife earlier, she's like, what show are we going on? I'm like, I'm like going on Parker's show. She's like, is that the guy who can't say his own last name? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're like, so we've been for like, for like last like hour, we've been like, Sedekaze, Sedekaze. Like, <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Oh, okay. So now you're bringing in that I can't say my own actual last name. I thought she thought Pensies was... That's no, right. Yeah, she's, she's like that's French. I don't care about that. That's uh, good. The, the Italian, she, you know. Okay, so so do you know how to say it right? Did she teach you how to say it? Sedicaze. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's what I've heard. I've never been able to pronounce that very well either. But it, does she? Do you know what it means? Has she told you? It's, it's what seven houses? Yeah, seven houses, yeah. man. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's so good. So now everyone knows I can't pronounce you know hardly anything. Uh, I'm, I'm okay at English, but yeah, no Italian or French for me. That's fine. English yeah. is the only language that matters, right? That's right, man. That's right. Uh, <laughs> well, Ryan, dude, I, I wore a shirt specially for you today. Trinity. Oh, I our alma mater spread. here. There Ted's we go. Grad. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm pumped about that. Uh, for those who don't know you, though, uh, I'm sure most people do, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about your background, who you are? Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Indiana and then uh, moved around a lot for school. So I ended up finishing my undergrad at Atlanta Christian College in Georgia. And then I did a master's in philosophy of religion at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, hence the, the TEDS connection. Uh, and then I went and did a PhD in theology at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and then jumped around from different postdocs at Notre Dame and uh, Cambridge, um, Edinburgh, St. Andrews and Helsinki. And then I taught at boarding school for a little bit as well. So yeah, it's awesome. Just yeah. Jumping I, all over the place. I like to think that you are collecting all the postdocs, uh, like, mm -hmm. like the gauntlet and you just got different postdocs and you're going to snap your fingers and uh, yes, I just love have that. all of them, especially <laughs> sure. all the institutes for advanced studies of them. I got yeah. Two of these. So yeah, man, you got a few more, got to catch them all. I love that. Well, so today, uh, we're going to be talking about, um, uh, little bit about Mars Hill, about ghost writing and, and uh, Mark Driscoll. This came up through Facebook because I made the mistake of saying I benefited from Mark Driscoll back in the day and everyone tore my face off. And I, even <laughs> though I said, look, I, I'm not condoning this guy, but he got me into theology and that's why. And people just lost it. But uh, you'd mentioned that you were almost the, the ghost writer. And I thought, dude, mm -hmm. And so then I guilted you to coming on my podcast to talk <laughs> to talk about. Um, but so just jumping in, uh, Mars Hill. For those who don't know, uh, well, there's a there's a great series. There's a great podcast series called "The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill," put on by um, Christianity Today, and it's a little soft. The guys are a little soft. That's okay. But I grew up in in uh, Mark Driscoll land, so so that's who I am. I wrestled and stuff. Um, but it's a great podcast, um, and. 
Mars Hill is a is a big was a big mega church, huge gigantic church. Um, got really popular in like 2010 through 2013, 2014, um, but but was huge before that as well in the 90s. And uh, the the head pastor Mark Driscoll was this really bombastic type dude, um, a bro. I think he. I think he knew his stuff, but a lot of people would say he's a charlatan and there's a whole thing with Mark, but, uh, Ryan, any, anything to add on like the, the history of Mars Hill that we need to know about before jumping in? I, I guess I would just say, I think there's a lot of layers to Mark and then all the people that are there. I, I mean, some of them, some of the people that I actually spoke with that worked there seemed like really genuine people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've heard that a lot of people thought Mark was very genuine in the early days and maybe kind of went. A, a bit uh off the rails later on yeah. um and then i think he's a really good speaker so whatever you want to say about him and there's a lot of things you could say i think he's a really good speaker and i can see why he would become a celebrity pastor and become yeah. like this mega church leader i mean he just has a very captivating personality yeah yeah that's that's something true at at that time so that's uh all this stuff is so cliche now too it's, it's hard to but like there's the young restless and reformed and the mm -hmm. new calvinism and it's hard for me to talk about that because uh, I was so deep in it that it's all mm. it's all like cliche now. And that's how I came into theology. Actually, uh, my brother was a uh, Arminian going into TEDS. He studied philosophy of religion there as well. And it was in uh, Dr. Tom McCall's class. Um, Dr. McCall went a little bit too heavy on an analogy of for Calvinism. <laughs> and my brother was, I bet you probably know the analogy. And my brother was like, I wonder if this Calvinism stuff is really what what that is and so he checked it out more and became a calvinist and dumped it on my lap and i became so inadvertently both <laughs> both set of case uh theology bros became calvinists through the armenian of armenians dr mccall mm -hmm. which is great yeah. and i went on to study with him later and we have fun sometimes i get a little too chippy with him on facebook but i love him um yeah so so that's uh that was my introduction to theology though was through mark and like you mm -hmm. said he um he's a great speaker and even back then, you could see there's some weird stuff. The way he talked about sex and stuff was always weird from the pulpit. Everyone knows that. It's all cliche to talk about. But uh, yeah, so so the new Calvinism type stuff is where I came in. But I wanted to ask you about about uh, your theology at the time. So um, let's how do how do we go into this? Uh, let's talk about your connection to to Mars Hill. Like how mm. did how did you get connected at all to be considered uh, potentially Driscoll's ghostwriter? Yeah. So at this point, so I finished my PhD in 2013 mm. and then the academic year of 2013, 2014, I'm at the University of Notre Dame. I'm at the Center for Philosophy and Religion and I'm applying for like just lots of jobs trying to find something. And I am still trying to process this, uh, the end of like a very serious relationship, trying to figure mm. out who I am as a person. Yeah. Uh, what do I believe about anything? Where does God want me? Because whatever plan I thought I had, that's all falling apart. So I'm like, I don't know. So I'm like, do I want to be in academia? Do I want to be in the church? I don't know. Let's let's see. And I started applying for church jobs. And a lot of the church jobs at that point, they were weird. Like you would, the advertisements for these things would have these statements like, we're looking for someone with a good stage presence uh, and who looks good on camera, who can wow. always deliver a 10 and who can like cast visions and make sure we get to the next level. Mm. And so it was like kind of corporate jargon speak. And I'm like, what is this? Yeah. Uh, and then a few places had these titles would be like theologian in residence. Mm -hmm. like Presbyterians were really big on that at the time. Okay. Uh, and then I saw this position from Mars Hill called theological researcher and editor. And what was unique about this one, it was, you could do it from anywhere in the world. And I was like, okay. Uh, and then they wanted someone who had an actual theological education. Like mm -hmm. you need to have at least a master's in like, you know, theology or biblical studies. And then you need to have experience with like publishing and writing and speaking to like lay audiences. And I was like, okay, this sounds all good. I've got all these I qualifications. Do, yeah. right. And then they also talked about like having Christ-like qualities and stuff. So it actually sounded like a church job. Yeah. Uh, unlike all these others where they want to be have like <laughs> stage presence. In their yeah. Room. Just look good. Yeah. And so it was like, okay. I was like, I've got the looks obviously, but yeah. like, I need, you know, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but what about a place that actually cares about Jesus or something? I mean, I guess that's what you want from a church. And yeah. So this place, they actually had that. Uh, and then at the time, I also had a friend who, uh, from Ted's, who was a old former classmate who was working there. Uh, oh, okay. And so I was able to contact him and see, like, what's the inside scoop here? Because I didn't mm -hmm. know a ton about Mars Hill at that point. I knew it was, like, controversial, but I didn't know why. So I was able to actually talk to somebody before applying for this thing. 
and yeah. figure out what's going on here. Well, what was your what was your own theology like at the time? Can you recall like where were where were you at theologically? It was a bit weird. So, I, like I said, I was like trying to process a lot of things at that point, trying to figure out who I am anymore. And so, if I had like a kind of somewhat well thought out systematic theology, mm -hmm. but I was starting to question everything, going like, I don't know. I thought God had a plan for me, and I don't know what that plan is. Right. Is God even trustworthy anymore? Yeah. And so I was just really trying to figure out what do I believe anymore. I have no yeah. idea. So I had something that was like vaguely reformed, okay. but I was I was giving up on a lot of. At that point, I'd pretty much given up on my Calvinism, but I still had a lot of kind of reformed thinking in other areas, and was just very open to a lot of these kind of ideas. But it really was at that point. I really was kind of lost for I don't know exactly what to believe anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Ryan, was that, I'm sure it's a mix of everything because we're mm -hmm. human beings and we're rational, oh, yeah. volitional Christians, but did that have anything to do with like your, your dissertation topic or your, your studies or was that, do you think it, it had more to do with the collapse of your relationship and the instability of not having a job type stuff? It was a bit of both. The majority of it would be the collapse of the relationship and the okay. inst job instability. I mean, yeah. that's the biggest thing. That is anybody in academia who's been on the job market for any amount of time uh, over the last like several years, yeah. it is soul crushing. I mean, I applied for over 80 jobs that academic year yeah. and just you get rejection after rejection and, and you get these really frustrating job interviews and you're just like, oh, wow. Like, uh, everybody hates me. God hates me kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, there's like 150 people applying yeah. for the same job as you. Oh, if you're lucky, I mean, as some of the jobs applied for, there was like 300 people applying for these things. And yeah, it's just, whew, it was, it was outrageous. And then my, my, uh, my former PhD advisor was like going through something. I don't know exactly what, and he was filling my head with these conspiracy theories about all these people hate you and they're out to get oh, you and yeah. shut you down. And I'm like, that's great. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It was, yeah. It, was, it was fun times. Yeah. Well, so I've, I'm a little bit downstream from you and, uh, I've had a lot of professors, encourage me that hey look we think that that you can keep going on and doing philosophy and theology uh, you're not going to get a job don't don't do that like this is good but don't uh do it go continue but don't continue and it's like yeah. stuff like that where like w i think that you're good at this but you're not gonna f and so i don't worry because i i'm gonna make millions and millions from this interview with you dude so this is go. how this is the plan <laughs> b my plan b is my plan a um okay so so that's can you just real quick, what did you do your dissertation on and who'd you do that under? Mm -hmm. So I did my dissertation at St. Andrews and I was doing it on God and time. That was the original the original thesis. And then I, at that year at Notre Dame, I was kind of beefing it up to try to make it into um, what, what eventually became the end of the timeless God. Yeah. So that's, that was that was a big project. Yeah. 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 Were you, were you, I can't remember. Um, I mean, I, I knew that. We did an episode on that. Uh, did God create time? Go check that one out, everyone. Um, super awesome. But was that with Crisp? I can't remember if he was. No, he wasn't there yet. He was my okay. he was my external examiner. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this was he okay. was still at Fuller at that point. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, man. So I, I brought that up, um, especially with Chris, just as a as a biographical note that I think you and Crisp, there's others too, but you guys are like experimental theologians. Does that does that word mean anything to you? Have you ever seen like Dark Material, his Dark Materials, or anything like that? No. Okay, but I'm familiar okay. with like the show. But like, uh, it's an interesting show. It doesn't really have much to do with it. But um, my friend Paul Maxwell, uh, we haven't talked in a little bit for those who know, but I still love Paul. He he had mentioned like that's what I'm doing, and I'm mm -hmm. like ah, maybe, but that's really what you and Oliver Crisp are doing. You guys are experimental theologians. You you test stuff out. Hey, can we? I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna experiment it with it and the tools you use are, are arguments and that's great because that's what theologians and philosophers should be doing so i just bring that up to say like man i appreciate the work you're doing and the, the work that chris does because you guys are examples to us of how to be you know experimental theologians you uh you're interesting because i could see someone saying like you have tossed off history and you've just gone out and, and it's really not true because Oftentimes you go back into history to take an argument that you don't think has been sufficiently yeah. refuted to bring that back up and soup it up. Um, and Chris will do things like, hey, can a Calvinist uh, be a, hold to libertarian free will? And everyone loses their mind. But I know they lose it. Yeah, it's so good. But so experimental theology. I love mm -hmm. it. I'm excited about that. When you were looking at um, this job, was this like uh, just a, a life preserver and you're reaching out for it? Or did this seem like a good thing to you? Like a, a research? Is that something that... that you would have been interested in? 
it so it was originally it was I was interested, and then at some point later on down the process, we'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just like I need something, okay. uh, otherwise I'll be jobless. But originally, yeah, I was thinking maybe God's plan for me is I finish this academic book, The End of the Timeless God, and then I work for the church. Mm. Uh, because I've always wanted to write stuff for lay audiences and speak to lay audiences. I worked in churches in the past, um, an ordained minister. I wasn't ordained at the time though. Um, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, I was, I was thinking like, maybe that's, maybe that's what God wants. So I was really, yeah. I mean, I had applied for a few church jobs. This wasn't the only one I applied for. It was the only yeah. one that, that started to go anywhere at, the, right. at that point. But, but yeah. So where, where are you, uh, ordained in? So I'm ordained in something called the independent Christian church. Okay. It's, um, it only really exists in America. It's um, the churches of Christ split with them at some point after the civil war. Uh, and then I think, what was the other denomination that came out? The disciples of Christ, I think came out of this. Uh, nice. Or maybe it the might. United uh, churches of Christ as well, but we don't always usually acknowledge their existence for some reason. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't yeah. know. My grandpa uh, and my grandmother were big into disciples of Christ before it just spiraled and, and collapsed. But my, uh, one of my relatives uh, helped found the Mormon church became a heretic. He was one of the three. I think his name's still up on the temple. They took it down. I think they put it back up, uh, rigged in. And then he came back and helped found the Disciples of Christ. And so I was mm -hmm. like, uh, this guy's sketchy, man. I don't know about the Disciples of Christ. But um, yeah, they're they're no longer around anymore. That's funny. Um, so I got that in my history, um, mm -hmm. which is wild. Go. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah. So you, you were looking for this job. Um, you weren't ordained at the time. So you got in contact with a uh, through a friend from Ted's, and can we can we start talking about that process? What would that look yeah. like? Yeah. So I'll just so I'll, I'll mention. Um, so my friend, I'll just call him L because I didn't. Yeah, I don't want to drag him into all, all of this yeah. stuff because I because he eventually resigned from the church. It was disgusted and didn't yeah. want anything to do with it. I was like, fair enough. But at the time, I just was like, hey, I know that Mars Hill is controversial. I don't really know why because mm -hmm. I've been in Scotland for the last few years. I wasn't paying attention to like what celebrity pastors in America are doing. I don't know. Uh, and, and he was like, yeah, Mark's like, you know, a bit controversial because he talked about sex uh, and he cusses sometimes. And I was like, well, everybody talks about sex and cusses sometimes. So I don't, what's, what's the big deal? And he's like, he's like, yeah, but no, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. I've really enjoyed working here. And he said, the job is really good. It's like a full-time job. Like, like it was like $75,000 a year salary and yeah. like benefits and everything. Uh, and he's like, Every, his, his experience has all been like really positive because he had started out with Acts 29, that um, that church planning organization, yeah, for sure. and then eventually got connected with Mars Hill and was working at one of their satellite campuses. I don't remember which one. There was uh, a so ton. He there was like a hundred. Yeah. yeah, they had tons of them. So he was so he was really positive about the whole thing mm -hmm. uh, at first. And so I was like, well, this is a good guy. Like, I, I know he's a good guy and I still think he is a great guy. So I trusted him. And so I was like, yeah. OK, I'll apply for this job and see what happens. So that was like that was like um, I think it was just just before Christmas uh, of uh, 2013, um, and then so like January 2014 is when I start actually like having some of these conversations with the church, and then it's in February when I start actually getting some interviews uh, with the church and everything. And yeah, this process so, goes a long time. Yeah, right, right. I remember you. you uh, we we talked about this, but what what. Uh... What were they? How were they describing the job? Like, what were what were um, what were they expecting of the whoever took this position? It depended on which person I talked to. So I spoke with mm -hmm. three different people primarily. I had three different interviews. So this interview stuff it goes from like I'm interviewing from between like February all the way till uh, April, and then there's a bunch of conversations after that in May. So this is a really long drawn up process. Mm -hmm. So some of the job descriptions they're asking me questions like, "Have you heard of Docent?" And, um, and have you heard of like Justin Holcomb? And they start like mentioning these things to try to figure out what scandals I'm aware of. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and and like, what do I think about some of them? Uh, and then a, the first description was, we have a bunch of uh, content we need created. We need someone to create curriculum for the adult education. We need somebody to uh, train up all the elders and all the teachers at the churches. Yeah. So we want someone who will create content on different topics that, that are pertinent to the church right now. And then someone who'll come out like once a month, fly out to Seattle once a month and train people on how to teach uh, the, the different things. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple different topics that came up. The first one that they mentioned was they needed some sort of stuff on self-harm. That was like a big thing that they were looking okay. at. And they had a lot of people. So they wanted to talk about self-harm. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was stuff like this. That was originally how the conversation started. Okay. Did you... Was there any like explicit like uh, 
hey, you're going to be a, a ghostwriter? Like, how did that, how did you start catching on to that? Um, so it was the second interview that I had with this guy named Anthony, who was, he's like director of communications or something. Uh, and he was basically like talking like, is director of media and, and communications. That was his title. And so it was this weird conversation. So I was in Scotland for a speaking tour. And so I'm like Skyping him uh, while I'm in a, like a friend's flat. And he does two things. One, we talk about the ghostwriting stuff and he breaks down the ghostwriting for me. Uh, Cause that's basically how resurgence that book from Driscoll right. had been written. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's basically like I write whatever the next book that Mark wants to, to write. And then he has to come along and like edit it to some particular percentage. I don't know if it's like 40% or something or what, yeah. and has to add his own like anecdotes and all that kind of stuff and make it his own. And then that's his book yeah. and my name's no longer on it. So it kind of came up in that conversation was Would the first time where it was explicit that like, this is what we want. I, I can't like imagine doing that. Um, just because of who I am and what I like, if I have a, an idea, there's so few that have not been thought of, like, mm -hmm. I want that thing for myself. I don't want anyone else touching it. I, mm -hmm. I know like for, for a lot of us, we're, we think this is a huge major, uh, warning sign. Like anyone who, anyone who heard Driscoll say that he would want a ghostwriter should have immediately, you know, called someone, but this still happens today. All these politicians, oh, yeah. all their new books are ghostwritten. Mm -hmm. And we'd be lucky if they even did 40%. And so like, mm -hmm. this is a major phenomena oh, that yeah. happens. It, it, it's crazy. I don't understand why someone would want a ghostwriter. Any idea? Like what, what's, what's the deal? I, I don't know because I, I was trying to think about that a lot because this was so new to me and mm -hmm. the scandals about the ghostwriting hadn't really come to the surface yet when I was right. having these interview processes. Oh, okay. So I kind of have this ethical dilemma after after that conversation. And I remember I was chatting with one of my friends in in Edinburgh in Scotland at that on this trip, uh, who is uh, a writer, and was like, "Would you ever think about ghostwriting?" And he's like, "It depends. Like maybe, um, you know, if they want me to like ghostwrite like their book, it's not my ideas. It's like whatever project they want. You know, okay, I could do that and get some money and move on." Yeah. And I, so I was going back and forth with this a lot. Because I was trying to think like, okay, what am I going to be writing though? Because during this particular stretch in February, it's not clear what they want me to work on. Okay. So I don't know what they want me to work on. And I was kind of starting to become aware that my, uh, my former uh, supervisor was kind of weaponizing some of my, some of my research against various people. Okay. Uh, I was just like hammering people over the head with uh, my modal collapse stuff. And <laughs> so I was starting to kind of have in the back of my head of like, my work can be weaponized and it's not pretty. Yeah. Uh, what is Mars Hill going to do with my work? Right. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can trust these people. I have no mm. idea. So it, yeah. it, it bothered me. Yeah. Okay. So I need to cross off weaponizing. Mm -hmm. Ryan's work. <laughs> Weaponize Mullins work. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that big circle around that the line through it. Yeah. That's, I, I guess I hadn't really thought about that. Um, but that does, that absolutely happens. Like, mm -hmm. and that, that still happens with your stuff, actually, man. People mm -hmm. on Facebook trade back and forth oh, yeah. with people's ideas as weapons. And it's cool. It's kind of fun, too. But not yeah. if you're being a jerk, right? Like, if you're doing right. it in an intellectually honest way and you're being, I like, you got to be able to tease. If you can tease, that's cool. But if you're being a jerk and hammering someone with someone else's idea, that's wild. Yeah. 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 I, I, um, I could never, I could never, I would never want to do, I would, I, maybe it's my ego, but I would be like, I wrote that book, you know, that's mm -hmm. making all these sales and yeah. stuff. Like that was me. I, I put those words together. Like, dang it. Yeah. So I was really conflicted about this. So two things made me like cry myself to sleep that night was oh, yeah. one, this ghostwriting thing uh, that he mentioned. And then the other thing was, so this guy basically lays out their entire business model uh, mm -hmm. for me. Uh, during this particular interview. And so he's he's like, he's like, oh, here's all the real estate we own. Here's our like portfolio. And it's like over a million dollar portfolio. Right. Uh, here's all the automobiles we own. Here's all the like, you know, like just lays out the entire like business structure for yeah. this thing. And I'm like, this, this isn't, a, it doesn't sound like a church anymore. Right. This sounds like a corporation. And this corporation wants me to write something and I don't know what they want me to write on yet. Yeah. And it, it felt gross, but it was also going, I need a job. What am I going to do? So it yeah. was, it was very, it was a, a lot of conflict, internal conflict that I was going through. Yeah, man, that, that's, that's rough. Did they have any idea, um, like who you were and what you had, had written on? Did, did that come into play at all? Or was it just like, this guy's a, a theological 
researcher and he can do what we need. That, that seemed it really like okay. what I had written on. They're just like, you know, at that point I just had, I didn't have a book yet. I just had publications, uh, okay. just articles. And so it's like Trinity incarnation. Okay, cool. Uh, some God <laughs> stuff, you know? Yeah. All right. You seem like, and I had a, like a, a paper in like the journal of reform theology. And so they're like, Oh, well, this guy sounds good. Okay. Uh, and then, and I'd gotten a good word from, uh, one of my friends, like my former classmate as well. They're like, Oh yeah, he's a really solid guy. And he, you know, yeah. So they just wanted someone who could write and who could make sure that there was no plagiarism involved, that the, like the citations were all done really well. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, I could do all that. I've got the experience to do these yeah. kind of things. Well, so this whole, the, there's a lot that a lot of different people jumped off the Mars Hill train mm -hmm. for uh, different reasons. This was a really big one for me uh, when I found out when I heard about the the plagiarism stuff, because at this time in my life, I was like just obsessed with books. And to hear that Driscoll was plagiarizing, like really messed with me for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And then I I heard a justification. I don't know if this is right or not, but I heard a justification that it was like, that no one claimed that Mark Driscoll wrote that. They claimed that Mark Driscoll, like TM, wrote that. Mm -hmm. Like there's like this entity that is a bunch of people are writing for the name Mark Driscoll. And that's where I was like, this is not cool. And I can't remember if this is when the Ravi Zacharias scandal broke about him claiming to be a doctor. Like, dude, there's oh. a bunch more you can say about that. But when when mm -hmm. that struck too, like he's using his honorary doctorate and calling himself Dr. Rep. And maybe it was because I'm a, a, a snob. I'm a education <laughs> snob. But those kind of things, I'm just like, man, that's not uh, that's not Christian character. Like we're no. not we're not supposed to boast about ourselves. Let someone else do it. And even then, like, don't make much of yourself, but you're supposed to decrease. And so when I started seeing that stuff. So it, it's it's uh, this is close to my heart because this is when I got off the Mars Hill train. Mm. Uh, right when I heard about the plagiarism, I was already kind of on the fence. Um, but so it's, it's interesting that this is something you got caught up in as well. Yeah. So the plagiarism stuff was coming out, uh, right as I was doing these interviews for this mm -hmm. job. So the just, this is what I found out later. Um, basically what happened was they saw that the plagiarism scandal was coming because okay. they had had like this really bad, uh, interview with, um, this radio interview with Janet Menford or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they decided they needed to cut their ties with docent and they wanted to hire somebody in house to do all the research for them instead of working through docent. And right. so that's why the job that I got, uh, offered was like, that's what, why it came available was because of, oh, that. wow. Okay. How yeah. scary is that though? That, that cause they would have, I mean, they would have controlled you. They would have owned you like all your mm -hmm. friends, everything. And I, I don't want to yeah. play like the cult card or anything like that, but like all your friends would be there. Uh, mm -hmm. your money is there. You're not going to say anything. And maybe you sign a. NDO no or yeah, yeah right right so terrifying it was kind of terrifying is because a lot of this stuff's coming out to light in a way that they can't really deny anymore while I'm doing all these interviews um and so Billy Abraham and Mike Ray gave me a lot of really good advice that year about what mm. to do so the job was remote uh, so I could do it from anywhere so Mike Ray gave me a title at Notre Dame and an office no paycheck Whoa. or anything oh, okay. uh, so I was gonna be cool, yeah it was still cool so I was gonna yeah. be like a research fellow at Notre Dame and then Mars Hill would be paying for everything. Um, but, oh, but okay. so like basically what, what I think Billy, the way you put it, he's like, he's like, we can scrub this from your resume. We'll just scrub this entirely from your CV. Uh, and, and he gave me a lot of advice about make sure they, they, they told you you could do it from anywhere. So make sure you sell them on why you need to be here at Notre Dame. And so you're not there in Seattle. So they can't control you all the time. Yeah. Uh, Cause he was, he was worried about that kind of thing. Cause I, Every, everybody was very worried about that kind of thing yeah wow man that that does sound like like great advice what a what an awesome thing for for mike to do and then mm -hmm. billy is just man he's awesome he, uh, yeah with, with went on to be with the lord uh recently but uh just a hilarious guy mm -hmm. and and super smart guy it was it's really cool that that uh, you got to know them and that they yeah. helped you out like that yeah, was anyone was, was that year what, was anyone like, hey, don't do this, do not do this, oh, whatever you yeah. do? There was a lot of people who were telling me this is not not good. Like I had a cousin that I talked to who was he was a church planter at the time. And so I had a lot of frank conversations with him uh, about that. And he was like, this is not this is not a good place. And he's, but he's like, I also he also knew, understood what it's like to not have a job and, yeah. and how desperate that is. Um, I had some other people that I worked with there at Notre Dame that year because like Carl Moser was actually gave me details of why 
Mark is so controversial. Okay. Because because this was the thing was like I'd ask people like what's the big deal to me like oh well, we talked about sex I'm like okay like so what like what's you wrote a book on sex what's the big deal and then right. like Carl was one of the first people to sit me down and go no 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 like here's all the context and all the details of what's been said and what's been going on and like oh okay this is now I see why this is controversial yeah um and then I remember um Ross Inman was there but he was always very he was very supportive of just like you know do what you got to do mm. uh and Philip Swenson uh was also in that same kind of boat of going like wow, yeah okay. I see what you got to do this but man have you seen some of these like he like sent me some articles about like 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 toxic stuff that was like these stories that were coming out and everything and but it was just yeah so i had people like warning me but also people understanding like you need a job and yeah. this is not a good situation to be in yeah yeah oh man dude well so how, how did this like I, I think god saved you from this how, yeah. how did how did how did it collapse? How did it not come to fruition with you and the job? So this is bizarre. Okay. So like I said, like I was, I was doing this interviews from like early February, like it was like late January to like, uh, to like March is when I had the final big interview with Dave Bruskus, who was like the second in command. Mm -hmm. Um, and throughout this whole process, each time they were like, yeah, we need to get you to Seattle right away. So you can meet everybody and sign the contract. Uh, and, and then they were just a bit impatient because I had all these speaking tours. So they wanted, they kept setting up these Skype interviews for me to meet more people. And each time they're like, yeah, yeah, we got to get you out of Seattle, sign a contract. Uh, and so March 27th was when I had the interview with Dave Bruskus. And this one was where like the, the ghostwriting became really explicit. Mm. But Dave also like really struck me as somebody who actually cares about the church and like, like actually like a real pastor. So yeah. it was very conflicted because it was like, okay, this is a genuine guy. Um, but the ghostwriting was really explicit. And then I found out what they wanted me to work on. What they wanted me to work on was they wanted a statement on transgender issues. Whoa. Yeah. And so this okay. is 2014. So they had, so they saw that this was coming. Yeah. That's, I, that's pretty early. Wow. Yeah. And I knew, and I agreed. I was like, yeah, this is what's coming. And I know like polyamory is going to be another big topic. And so yeah. we were talking about these things, but they wanted a statement on it. And I was like, what do you want that statement to be? Uh, and they're like, well, we need you to come up with it. And I'm like, where do you guys land on these issues? Cause I, yeah, you, right. know, you know, cause this is going to be, this is going to be, is, oof, whatever they want to say it's gonna be controversial well and how uh, how, how do they know what you're gonna say like what I, I don't know because they were asking me questions too and i was we we're both playing our cards we we're just bas basically everybody's just playing a big game of poker at this point yeah what like, do you, what do you, you say think? first <laughs> yeah no one wanted to say anything first yeah uh, and i still don't want to say anything first so um, right yeah. right so what we agreed on was i will come up with a document that will have like all the different kind of positions you could take on transgender issues and arguments for and against everything yeah and then they can do whatever they want with it was kind of the sort of thing we had settled on and then mm -hmm. i'll come out to seattle well schedule a trip out to seattle very soon uh again so we can sign the paperwork and i can meet everybody was it was how it goes so what happened though so this is march 27th two days later a website goes live and it's four former pastors uh, and elders from Mars Hill. They create this website of going, we confess all of our sins the way we've hurt all these people. And then here are all of our grievances against Mars Hill. Yeah. And then they invite people to add their own stories of their own like toxic experiences with Mars Hill. Uh, yeah. So that, that, uh, so in the, in the rise and fall of Mars Hill, I think some of the stuff they played up and they're playing sad music and it's like, yeah. all right, dude. But when, when they talked about, it might've been the last or the second to last episode where they were talking about the, the two elders who were totally just ousted. And mm -hmm. like those two guys were awesome guys. Mm -hmm. Like those guys were godly men who shepherded people. And when you hear that, you're like, okay, I definitely get the problem. I definitely see if men like this are railroaded then yep. yes, there's a problem. And so, so I, I believe those two guys uh, were on the site or they had their own site, but that comes out like, what are you, what are you thinking? I like, I'm like, I'm going to certainly go like what's happening here. And then at that point, the plagiarism stuff comes back again in full force. Cause like the publisher had already said, like, it's not plagiarism. It was just bad citation. Yeah. But then there's all these other accusations of like, oh, there might be plagiarism in some of the other books. Mm -hmm. And then all these all these uh, stories about all this toxic uh, culture stuff is starting to come out and you can't and like they're adding new stories like every day. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm like, what am I getting into? And so that was when, uh, if I remember correctly, I think that's when um, I spoke with Billy and Mike and we devised this plan of okay. how to basically hide everything on my CV. So I'm yeah. so it looks like anybody who looks at my CV when I'm applying for jobs is to go, oh, OK, well, you're just at Notre Dame. And and then I'm like, OK, well, 
I'm going to ghostwrite something. My name will not be on that. Yeah. And it better not be on that was right. kind of what I was thinking. Each night as I'm crying myself to sleep going, God, please give me something else. Like give me another job, man. Well, uh, we could talk a little bit of counterfactual stuff here. Like mm -hmm. what would, how, how would this have affected your career? Do you think any, any ideas on like, if, if you got this job and then welcome to the collapse, like, mm -hmm. is this impacting your, your intellectual life? You think? Oh, probably. Cause whatever projects they would have wanted me to work on. I mean, I know like transgender, like I said, was one of them. I don't know what else. Yeah. I mean, that's a big chunk of your research time. So to be able right. to finish up any other kind of projects, I, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't know if I'd be able to It'd be really time consuming. Well, and, and then, if, if it did get out that like, here, here's a ghost writer, you know, and like, mm -hmm. like, dude, that's your, that's on, we're talking about yeah. that right now. Then that, I, I'm interviewing his former ghost writer, you know, like that's yeah. what, what's happening. Yeah. And, and again, I'm also really paranoid at this point of like, will they weaponize whatever yeah. I create? Because like I said, like what Dave wanted me to create was this document of here's all these different positions you could take and here's mm -hmm. arguments for and against. What are they going to do with that in the end, though? I have no well, idea. And and so, you know, I, I talked about how you're an experimental theologian, and, and part of what makes you really fun to listen to, but to read as well, is you soup up all the sides, and <laughs> until you come to your conclusion, the reader's like, what the heck, dude? I don't right. know. That all sounds smart. <laughs> because you're really good at, at showing point-counterpoint stuff. And so it is kind of scary to think of you doing all this research and someone just throwing away all the counterpoints and going, look at how strong this case is. Therefore, blam, I'm going to use it to my, without all the extra work that you mm -hmm. like always do. That would be yeah. really scary. Yeah. yeah Cause I, I'm like, there's no way they're going to put all of that stuff in right. whatever book they're going to do. I mean, I have no right. idea. So I, I'm just like, I don't know what they're going to do, Yeah, but I need something. So it's either be like be jobless uh, or do something to keep me afloat for a while until I can find something else. Yeah. And it was not a fun uh, thought process but i it's so sad like you didn't even get any money from them you just got no. grief right like how yeah. did it end up just it it devolved and spiraled so it spirals so it, so like i said like so there's a this website goes live and everybody's given their grievances and then the new york times bestseller list uh scandal comes out mm. uh so for to, to remind anybody who doesn't know um so basically mark spent two hundred thousand dollars you pay this company two hundred thousand dollars they buy up all your copy, a bunch of copies of your books. So that way it gets onto the New York times bestseller list. Yeah. Uh, and then they eventually sell the books legitimately after that. But, right. but yeah, so you get up on the, on the New York times bestseller list right away. And what I didn't know at the time when that, when that scandal came out, a bunch of people are just resigning left and right mm -hmm. at Mars Hill. Like people are like, they're just losing all their elders. Um, uh, they, uh, one estimate I saw online said they lost about 4,000 people from their congregation. Yeah. So like they're just hemorrhaging money and hemorrhaging people left and right. And so at this point they just go radio silent. So like, they're like, yeah, come out to Seattle next week. And then I just hear nothing for like ages from them. And then eventually at the end of April, I finally get uh, to talk to this HR woman named Jacqueline. And I've been talking with this woman the entire time. Uh, she's been the one that organizing all the, the meetings and stuff that I had with them. And I finally get her on the phone. I set up like a phone meeting with her to find out like, where is this job contract? Like, like yeah. I've been waiting for months for this. Come <clears> on. <throat> and so she calls me and she, first thing she says is she's like, Oh, hang on. I don't know what job you applied for. I don't know anything about this. I'm not spoken to anyone you've been interviewed with. And I'm like, you set up all the interviews. Like <laughs> I I've got the email chain. Like, like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And then she kind of like, I can hear her like rustling around some paper and stuff. And then she's like, okay, here's your job offer. It's $14 an hour and we're hoping to give you an hour or two of work a week. Are you what? surprised by this? Yikes. And I just remember the way she said, are you surprised by this? Cause she clearly planned on saying that it was just so well rehearsed and I, I lost it. I was so pissed off. I'm, I'm just like, I'm like, you don't interview like a top scholar for several months for like an hour or two, like work a week. Like this was supposed to be like a 75 K job. Like, you know, like what, what are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, and she's like, she's like, Oh, I'm very sorry. I don't know anything about this. You know, we'll, I'll try to get you on the phone with somebody else uh, later. I'll set up another meeting and, and everything just kind of ends there. But I, I, I lost it on her. Like I was, what, Oh man, I was so pissed. What, what was that supposed to do? Was that supposed to make you mad so that you just go away? You think, or were they legitimately like, yeah, we can give you a couple. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me. And then when I finally got on the phone with somebody else, like uh, it took a, a few weeks later, I got on the phone with that CEO kind of guy, Anthony. And he, 
he's kind of like faffing around and he eventually kind of gives me the story of like, Oh, uh, well we fulfilled that position like, like a long time ago. And I'm like, then why were you telling me to come out to Seattle to sign a contract? Like right. you told me to come out to Seattle like multiple times. And he's like, Oh, well we were trying to see if we wanted to hire maybe two people for this position. Hmm. And I knew that was a lie because I had been speaking with like, you know, this other elder who told me like I was the only one they were interviewing. Yeah. Uh, and, and this guy's just like, he's just embarrassed. He, he doesn't know what to say. And then he just kind of ends the conversation. He was like, well, I'll try to figure something else out for you. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. And then I get an email from somebody else saying like, Oh, sorry, I had this really rough email. Um, you know, we'll try to smooth things over. We'll try to get you some more work. So I don't know what was going on because I keep getting these emails from people saying like, we're sorry, like we're going to try to sort, sort this out for you, get you the right thing. Uh, and then I contact my, I contact Dave Bruskus to be like, yeah. what's going on here? And he's like, Oh, I don't know anything about this job. That's, that's between you and Anthony. I'm like, okay. And then I contact my friend who is the, the elder and he, and he's like, Oh, I resigned. Yeah. Uh, he's like this, he's like, this is one too many scandals. This, this New York times bestseller list thing. That was the last straw for me. I can't trust the leadership. I'm out. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I'm stuck with these people who I don't know what's going on over there. I don't, I didn't know that they were like hemorrhaging money and like losing all these people. And I'm just like, this is awful. I don't know what I'm going to be. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> and I don't know if this is jobs even coming out, but they've just offered me like nothing. And then they're like, oh, we're going to get you something. I swear. Uh, just give us a little bit of time to like scramble and put things together. Yeah. Did you get like a, was that the end of it? Or did you get like a stomp off moment of like, you wasted my time and screw you. I did. I had a big stomp off moment. So it's kind of radio silence for like a while. And then in, in uh, early July, I get the job at Cambridge after that. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, who do I want to like, I talked to Billy Abraham about this and, and he was like, he's like, okay, we need to get you this job at Cambridge, you know? Uh, and that way you can just tell him to stuff it. Just like, you know, just, just tell him to stuff it. Uh, yeah. it's, it's nice. Like, <laughs> like Irish accent. Uh, right. Everything. <laughs> and then I do, I get, I get the job at Cambridge. And so I write an email to, to Dave and it's a long email, but I have this moment in the email where I'm like, I'm like, it just, it seems odd to me that Mars Hill is willing to spend $200,000 to manipulate the New York times bestseller list, but offers low ball wages to the researchers who do the majority of the work, putting the book together. This indicates to me that Mars Hill does not have its priorities in order and that needs to change. And then I signed it, you know, Dr. R.T. Mullins, lecturer, University of Cambridge. You know, just like, oh, nice, dude. That like, feels good. You. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was a satisfying moment. But yeah. Oh, that was months of frustration. Oh, man. Yeah. This is the strife going on. They pulled you in and you didn't even get the benefit of buying food with any money. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> just... get nothing. I got nothing. Oh, man. That's so rough. Is there is there a moral here? Is there like a lesson for theologians that are, you know, coming up? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> so th there's this movie called uh, like Burn After Reading. I think it's yeah, this bizarre yeah, yeah. spy movie. Super uh, crazy. And, yeah. And so there's this one. There's this one band um, from Sweden that I listen to. They've got this clip from it uh, from that movie at the end of it. Uh, and and these like two guys that I think it's like the CIA. They're talking to each other and they're like, "Well, well, what did we learn from all this?" <laughs> uh, well, sir, I don't know. I, I guess we learned not to do it again. I don't know what we did, but uh, right. yeah, yeah, I guess, we'll I, guess we'll, I guess we'll never do it again. And that's that's how I feel after this. I'm like, I'm yeah. like, I don't know what lesson you learned from this. I don't know. Yeah, we learned not to do it again, but I don't know what we did. So yeah. I don't know what we're not doing again. Seriously, there there was a there was a uh, a young lady in some of my TED's classes, and she was a theological researcher for a uh, mega church, and all of us were like salivating because she was like mm -hmm. she was a first year like. Man, I don't know. I'm kind of a judgmental jerk sometimes. I'm like, dude, I know some theology. What the heck? We we're all kind of like salivating after that job. Even some of the professors were like, are you serious? That sounds great. And she's getting paid a lot of money. And now as I think on her story in light of yours, I'm like, Eesh, that's a that could be a really scary spot. It could be amazing. It could be great. But she was answering answering theological emails for the church. So people mm -hmm. would ask the pastor questions. And I think she might have been answering in his name. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure. And, and that I think is ghostwriting, right? Like... Yeah, that that's where it feels weird to me, because so the Presbyterian churches I was looking at, they had theologian in residence mm -hmm. title. And so it was no ghostwriting. It was like, oh, that's the person that's doing this stuff for us. Right. They are theologian in residence. And then uh, eventually later on, like about a year or two later, I almost worked for another church where that's what they wanted me to do as well. But it was going to be like Ryan, you know, like 
my name's going to be on it. Yeah, yeah. There's no ghost writing or anything like that. Right. Um, and that seems like that seems legit to me to be like, yeah, this is this is the person we have. We've we've got at the church who can handle this kind of stuff. Like that seems like a really cool thing if you if your church can afford that. Yeah. But ghost writing though, it, I I guess okay. So like you mentioned earlier, like all the celebrities, like when they write their autobiography. Yeah. Right. And that's a ghost. That's I mean, it's a ghostwriter doing right. it. That's a lot of money going into this. I yeah. mean, those ghostwriters get a ton of money. The idea of a church spending money on stuff like that, it feels a bit gross to me. Yeah. There yeah. might be ways to justify it, but ah, gosh, so, man, I don't know. I, I hear you. And I, uh, back, back at the same time, I remember listening to Ben Shapiro like every day. And Shapiro said that he had ghostwritten for a really famous politician and he can't talk about it and all this stuff. And I was like, it was the first thing I, first thing I heard of. But when you and he was like, this is something that everyone does, just so you know. And so I get that oh, yeah. the New York best time seller thing. I remember uh, Mariah Carey's old uh, uh, whoever she worked with. He was like this dude. He's really famous and he would make pop stars really big uh, agent or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he would do it by buying up all their CDs. And a, he was an old timer type dude. And a lot of the new guys were like, we don't do that anymore, pops. But like, that's a thing that, that the mm -hmm. world does. And so. In one sense, I could totally see people being like, look, if we want to grow, these are grow growth methods, growth tactics. But when you think from a Christian perspective, you're like, this is gross. Like, we're not gross. supposed to be like that. That We're not mm -hmm. those people. We don't do that stuff. Because that's, here's the thing is like, in one sense, like, yes, everybody in entertainment, everybody in politics, they're all doing it. Right. But when you look at that organizations that they're they're hiring, the organ part of what the organization is getting paid to do is to hide the fact that they're doing it. <laughs> right. So like they're trying to hide the fact that this is ghost written. They're trying to hide the fact right. that um, and to the, boost up this one person's ego and, and they don't say ego, but their reputation and their platform, right. All that it's stuff. Ego. Yeah. 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 It's the ego it's the image it's the brand. Yeah. yeah. So we know this, but they're also, if they're doing, if they're doing a good job at it, they make themselves invisible. Right. Uh, so there's a kind of secrecy, a kind of like cloak and dagger thing going on here. Right. And I'm like, right. that, that should that should kind of give you give you a hint of like hang on why do you need all this cloak and dagger stuff going on right. everybody's doing it but why why is everybody also trying to hide the fact that they're doing it yeah the, 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 feels gross feels gross yeah so i i i jumped ship to like matt chandler i used to be huge mm -hmm. in matt chandler because uh on one of his books it's around here somewhere he said um with jared c wilson and uh i remember either i tweeted or my brother tweeted at jared wilson we're like hey what'd you what'd you do on this yeah uh what, what what was your part in in chandler's book and he was like oh dude uh i just like helped put together a lot of his sermons and, and helped think through and like helped him co uh, collect this he's the first guy to ever give me uh any kind of credit he's the only guy who's ever done that and that's when i was like oh. holy cow like wow, that's amazing. He's done this before and no one's ever credited him. And Chandler was like, oh, why would I not put this dude, Jared Wilson's name on the cover? Of course I'm going to do that. And so then I was like, okay, Chandler, no Driscoll. And then from there, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how ubiquitous it is, but it does seem a bit weird if if that's what all the celebrity pastors are doing. Right. I don't know if they are all doing it though. Yeah. Um, but because like i mean like john piper i mean he doesn't put put a book out like every year or something he he spaces those out so i'm assuming he probably right. writes those himself yeah i can't imagine piper doing that either he's so hardcore yeah uh, yeah yeah whereas like some of these other people where they're like it's a it's like a book a year and i'm like mm, now, <laughs> yeah. I'm kinda, now i'm kind of curious right um the only one i know is like Maybe you or, or I know Joe Schmidt, as soon as he starts writing books, he's already got one that that'll be a book a month or whatever like that. Yeah. Cause he's insane. But, um, man, what about, so I still want to bring like a moral here or something, but like, I just don't know what the moral is. I don't I mean, know either. Problem. Just like plan B jobs for theologians. Like, oh yeah, you should definitely are, have a plan B job, but what, what are those? So you don't get like, what, what do you think? Are there, are there actually any plan B jobs if you're a, if you're a systematic theologian, like what, what do you do? I, the plan B jobs that I was looking at were jobs working for churches. Mm -hmm. And I think I just got unlucky with some of the churches that showed a lot of interest in me. Yeah. Um, whereas like, I like a lot of the normal churches, I, I, like they went with somebody else. Okay. Uh, because I, I just, I don't think I looked like 
a pastor. I don't have the look, uh, like physically, I don't have the look anymore. <laughs> and then I didn't know how to talk the way that American evangelicals talk because they changed the language on me. Yeah. And I actually, that would actually help me out in one job interview because I was like, I don't know how to talk like an evangelical anymore. I don't know the words you're using. And they're like, well, what? And I'm like, well, look in your job advertisement, use the word casting vision. Oh man. <laughs> you know? And like at the time I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I was living in Scotland and I'm living in England at the moment. I just saw like I was just at the at the King's Cross uh, like the train station and I saw pla like platform nine and three quarters. So I've got like all this Harry Potter stuff in my head. Yeah. And I'm like, are you just doing Harry Potter stuff? Like, what is that? And they're like, <laughs> oh, no, we just mean a five year plan. And I'm like, oh, we'll just say that. Like, right. Why don't we make it like try to make it like quasi mystical? Like I'm it's got to be cast. Dude. Yeah. I work what for a evangelical ministry and that was one of our things starting in like around 2014. Like you have to be a good vision caster. You have to cast vision. I remember being like, if I can't work for you guys. If you say it again, I'm going to throw up. I can't mm -hmm. do the vision cast. But yeah, we do this weird thing. We grab a lot of times. I think we do grab it from like business world. And it's like, you know, I read this leadership book. How can I pull this in? And it's like, dude, I get it's good intentions, but you're going to make me sick. I can't yeah. do it with all the language. Yeah. And so that that really got to me a lot. So that was the problem was, I guess, like, I'm like, OK, plan B would be work for a church. But then a bunch of churches, they're following these bizarre fashion trends that you've not kept up with. Yeah. And so you don't know how to talk the lingo. Um, but I had a lot of classmates who did. That was what they wanted all along was okay. to go back into a church. So I think they had the right kind of profile for it. They yeah. they w knew how to talk a particular way. They got connect with church planting organizations or or something else. Yeah. Um, so that's a good plan B. But other than that, I don't know. Um, a lot of people right now, they're getting jobs at like high schools, like a lot of private high schools and yeah. stuff. Yeah, and I did that for a while. I, I taught Teaching at a boarding Latin school and stuff, and mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's good stuff. Like the boarding school I worked at, like those students were bright. They were better than some of the students I had had in Scotland. Um, I wow. mean, like they were they were really good. And yeah. so yeah, I think th those guys could be. That's like a really really satisfying plan B. Yeah, but whatever but, whatever it is, like it's not podcast. So like uh, theologians don't go into the podcast world. Uh, there's already it's already saturated. We don't mm -hmm. need competition. <laughs> Yeah, there's no money in it. It's it very saturated. <laughs> Leave us alone. Let us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. give no, me, you... give me all the money. Screw you guys. That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> um, man, yeah, that's. I'm still trying to think if uh, if if one of us could be the next Tom Morris here. Like, how do we get <laughs> that? How do we get that dude's job? <laughs> that would be that would be that would be a, that's that would be amazing. But uh, I don't know if our culture even supports that kind of stuff anymore. I don't. I don't. I don't know because I feel like that's Doom a very particular it. era. And he just fit into it so well. Yeah, man. Step yeah. right in. Yeah. Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, where you're at now, like mm -hmm. theologically and stuff, and how you've changed. Would I ask you a uh, terrifying question? Are Are you an evangelical? Like, can, do you consider yourself evangelical? If they'll still have me. I mean, that's the thing. Is like, I the denomination I like I'm ordained in that I grew up in. I kind of went away from that for a while because it's, it's always the cool thing to do is to like try out a different denomination gotcha. and yeah. you know you like become Eastern Orthodox or something like that. <laughs> right. uh, so you got to flirt with all those things or mm -hmm. go like really really reformed or go Catholic. You know, you got to do something other than be to. evangelical. Like that's you right. have to do that for a while. Uh, and so I did flirt with like those kind of things for a bit, but then. So my denomination was a group of people who were in Scotland who got fed up with denominations. And they're like, we're going to go to the new world. We're going to go to America and just consider ourselves Christian. Mm. Bare bones Christianity, just be Christian. Yeah. And then after being in Scotland for three years for my PhD, I kind of got into that idea of like, yeah, it wouldn't be cool to just all of this BS, just like cut it out, put it down to the side and just go bare bones Christianity. I'm just Christian. Wouldn't yeah. that be nice? Yeah. So I kind of went back, I guess, to my roots in some sense. Uh, which were which which just is a very bare bones kind of Christianity, just essentials unity, non essentials liberty, and in yeah. all things charity. Yeah. Wow, man, that's awesome. I've I've kind of come full circle myself. I grew up in the yeah, EV Free Church and mm -hmm. just squish ball central and like you know evangelical fish. I I uh, grew up wrestling since first grade, so like that was right. kind of my my vision of a man. And I'm like, there's no men in the church. So then like Driscoll comes through and yeah. The one thing that got me with Driscoll is he'd always talk about the size of his neck. And I'd always be like, uh, your neck's not that big guy. Like the rest of us, some of us are wrestlers and we don't talk about the size of our necks, even though all of us have thick, like, we don't do that. That's not what men do. Men don't talk about the size of their neck. What are you doing? It's a weird so thing was, to brag about. It's super weird. And it's like a very specific thing. It's so odd. But, uh, so that one always irked me with him, but <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I, I came full circle. I'm, I'm back in a EV free church and, um, I don't know if it was. 
I think going to TEDS and seeing that I could take classes from Dr. Louis, who is a Lutheran, and Arkady, who's Anglican, and all sorts of people, you know, like mm-hmm. Van Hoos and whatever he's got going on now. I got Anglicans and and it was really cool to see like um, for me, it was really humbling to yes. say um, I disagree with Lutherans on baptism and stuff. But Dr. Louis would eat my lunch so mm-hmm. bad. So I can't be out here boasting and bragging about how these guys are idiots because I'm the idiot here in the room. I'm the dumb one and all of them disagree with me and each other. And so it was just really cool to see that they loved each other, that they all loved the gospel, and they were always constantly hammering the gospel. I was like, this is cool. This is like the you, the, the free church spirit that I like. Yes. And that was one of my one of the things I loved about my experience at TED's mm-hmm. was having all those different kind of theological voices coming together and go, yeah, we agree on these essential things. Right. And, and, and we and, disagree on uh, all these other stuff, but we do so politely and right. c- like with civility. I loved that. That was always and, so good. And somehow all of us are uh, uh, pre-mail or uh, like somehow that's the thing that unifies. And we, we don't ask us too much about that because we don't know how sure we agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which they've changed, which is great. Which is Oh, great. I didn't realize they changed that. They changed okay. it while I was in school. And I was like, so now what do you guys think? You know, Dr. Carson, um, still pre-mail or are you on mail now? What do you say? <laughs> yeah, those were good times. Man. That's hilarious. Those were good times. So, um, yeah, so I've come, I've come kind of full circle there too. You, um, you said you were like we're flirting with reformed theology, and now you're you're not. Where where are you at, man? Do you do you have? I know you want to be ecumenical, and that's awesome. I, mm-hmm. I, I appreciate that. Do you have like positions where you're like I'm a, a Molinist more, or I'm I'm now like more on open theism, or any any of that stuff? Yeah, because okay, so because the big term project is just to go here's all these models of God, mm-hmm. which one's the right one, and so right. I'm trying to identify arguments for and against each one, and so Molin like uh, the neoclassical model of God, I'm like yeah, that's good. But you mm-hmm. could be like a theological determinist or a Molinist on that kind of account. Right. And I really like my Molinism. But then as I'm digging into the free will literature, I'm just like, man, this stuff's hard. It's really hard. Mm-hmm. And I keep going back and forth. I'm like, libertarianism seems obvious to me. But then you'll see some compatibilist arguments. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> um, so that kind of bothers me. But then I'm much more favorable and open towards open theism than I used to be. Like, I think there's a lot more going on there. So I think like as a backup plan, you know, like if yeah. like if Molinism just you can't salvage it, then I'm like, yeah. hey, OK, now, this view's got a lot more going for it than I thought uh, yeah. it did. Uh and so like, so the main thing that was just trying to figure out what, what are the models of God that really like, if Christianity is true, which of these models of God needs to be in place? I mean, that's kind yeah. of what I'm trying to really figure out. Um, the incarnation, I've changed my views on that. I like, I, I, I kind of like this like functional canonic sort of Christology. Yeah. So he doesn't give up, like he doesn't give up his omni properties or anything, but he like gives up the exercise of those properties for the sake of like, undergoing a human experience. Um, when it comes to atonement, I have no idea. <laughs> I like I used to know, but like now I'm just like, I got nothing, man. I don't know yeah. what's going on with the atonement. Yeah. No clue. There's so many different theories, and I'm like, I don't like any of these. This, this is awful. That's that's what the so I used to I've grown as grown. Oh, that's nice. Um I, I used to think Craig was the boogeyman and and he was terrible and blah blah blah. I went through phases of him. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. But I his model where he's like, Well, you know, it's like a multifaceted gem. And I'm like, mm-hmm. dude, all right, cool. So we get to have a little bit of everything, and then People just rage against it though, because they're like divine child abuse. I'm like, dang mm-hmm. it, dude. All right. You're like, okay, this is the level of discourse. That's the <laughs> other thing that keeps me from publishing on certain topics is mm-hmm. the level of discourse. Uh, so like there's certain issues like the disability stuff that I published on. That was the first thing I published on was disability yeah. theology. And and I was like, after my experience with that crowd, like I'm not publishing until they raise their like level. Are of you discourse. serious? I thought that would be like a really like accepting and hospitable, <sighs> nice. No, I had no I, idea. Wow. Yeah, I still get called an ableist. Like every once in a while, I'll see like a like I'll get an alert like, oh, you've been cited, and you know this thing, and they'll be like, oh, the ableist perspective, you know. Wow. Ryan Mullins. And I'm like, okay, okay. tell the uh, Special Olympics community in in my hometown that I'm promoting the ableist perspective. Yeah, tell them that and see what they have Seriously, to say. Man. Yeah, but um, I like, but some people like like Kevin Tempe and like Scott Williams and some of the others, yeah. others that are like jumping in the conversation. I'm like, good, you guys make the conversation better. Right. Then I'll consider coming back in. Like, yeah, yeah. That's that's how I feel about um, well, anything on like masculinity is mm-hmm. so scary and terrifying. And this video will get flagged now because I talked about that. But you mentioned it, yeah, right. But that's that's something that um, Driscoll did a huge service at first, and then a gigantic disservice. Mm-hmm. Where now, if someone like me, who's kind of a bro, who wrestled, who I like lifting weights, and I want to 
bend iron and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I like that. It's cool to me. I read the Old Testament for David's mighty man, you know, mm -hmm. and like, I, there, there's not really a place. And I don't want to pour me, boo hoo. But um, Driscoll had a big part in ruining that, in yes. taking that, in, in caricaturizing it and running it into the ground so that those kind of guys who I don't think are served very well, at least in evangelical churches, are just like, no, that's not what a man is. A man is not someone. Who, okay, that's not everything a man is, but there are men like that. And I, I would love to talk about that more, but it's, you, you can't. Oh, you like can't. That. Yeah, you yeah. can't have a healthy conversation on that anymore. No. 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 So yeah, there's certain like topics in theology where I'm just like, I'll wait until things cool down before I'll consider reading up on this anymore because yeah. I just don't, I think you guys are all awful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a few topics. And then like, yeah. eschatology stuff, like I'm like, okay, resurrection's coming. I'm going to weigh in on that. I weigh in on a bunch of stuff in life after death and everything. Um, but like pre-mill, all mill, all this kind of stuff. I'm yeah. like, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to stay away from all yeah, that. Yeah. Like, I heard, I had a friend once say, uh, I was asking about this when I was super into it. I was reading like Sam Storms and I was all ready to be on mill. And, uh, my friend's like, yeah, I'm pro mill. And I was like, what the, what is that? And he's like, oh, I'm for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for whatever it is, like I'm that. pro. I'm pro. I was like, all right, that's a good one. Do you, uh, do you, so, you, okay, you're a uh, philosophical theologian. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of work as like a philosopher. I think it's totally fair to call you that as well. Do you consider yourself a like systematic theolo uh, theologian as well? Like, is, do you, would you say, no, I'm mm -hmm. more of a philosophical, or would you say, yeah, I'm a systematic theologian? Well, theology is the study of God. Mm -hmm. And and the number of times I would be in some situations, especially when I was at St. Andrews, one of the biggest insults they would give uh, is to be like, oh, well, that's just philosophy of religion. You're not doing theology uh -huh. anymore. Uh, and and I was like, I'm talking about God more than you are. I'm talking about God more than any of you are. That's right. the only thing I'm talking about is God, like just doing yeah. God stuff. I thought that's what theology was, was the study of God. Right. So in one sense, I'm like, yeah, I am doing systematic theology because mm -hmm. I'm trying to go, okay, what exactly is the doctrine of God? And then how does that fit with all these other things we want to say uh, mm -hmm. about the Christian, the standard Christian story of, you know, uh, is God coming as a human and to, in order to save us, uh, offering us life after death, um, forgiveness of sins, all these things. How does all of that fit in? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, there's a very real sense in which I'm going, I am doing systematic theology. Yeah. There's just a bunch of topics in systematic theology that I'm probably never going to write on. I'm probably never going to write on the doctrine of the church. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to write on communion because my denomination were like, it's just a symbolic thing. And I'm very convinced of that. So I'm not going to have anything more to say. Like, But you still got that uh, transgenderism in your pocket that you're ready to Sure, to I could I'll, that. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> pull that one out at some point. <laughs> uh, I asked because I'm wondering, like, uh, I talked with, with uh, Oliver Crisp on this about systematic theology being like an old man's game, or an old mm. lady's game, whatever, or old mm. person's game. Uh, because it's like after a career of publishing on different stuff, like Dr. Craig's working on that right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, do I call him Dr. Craig because I think maybe he might come on. William Lane Craig is, is working on that right now. Is that would that ever be on your radar to be like, here's what I think theology is? Here's a systematic theology a la ryan mullins i've had a lot of people push me to do that i don't know uh even um uh, ali pecovino uh, one of my colleagues in helsinki he's like he's like we should write a paper together on um you know just like what exactly is systematic theology what are the goals and what are the limits of it i'm like okay okay maybe maybe uh, that sounds good we'll do that and then but then like uh, my friend uh, aku vasala is there I, I'm like, let's write a paper on is God a psychopath? Like that'll be more fun. <laughs> like, uh, so I, I don't know. So it might be like, it might be that I write a whole bunch of these like crazy papers, and then I can easily go, yeah, these all do fit in a systematic uh, like doctrines and stuff. But well, I that's know. what I mean. It would be it would be a wild systematic because mm -hmm. it, you know most people are like, well, should prolegomena you know come here or should doctrine of God or doctrine of the Word of God come first? And you're like, well, should God be did God create time? Is he a psychopath? Which one do I put first? Right. First, yeah. Which would be exactly. so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would love that, man. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to that. I there's no there's probably no moral to the story. It just sucks. Is. It was just yeah. rough. Um, it was a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> things happened yeah and i had to move on like yeah. that was that's really it yeah be i be careful uh i don't know watch have a plan b job that's i don't know figure out a plan b and then come tell me about it too uh because i need one but i i guess here's here's okay here's something i could say this is also like dating advice you come up with a bunch of red flags and then you write them down on a piece of paper 
Mm-hmm. And then when you encounter people, you go back to that piece of paper and go, did they do all these red flags? Mm. And if so, you get out of there because that's yeah. something I have been terrible at in the past of not looking for those red flags. And so that was one of my experiences with a church of going, there's all these red flags. I don't even know what I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, and then now going, okay, now I know what the red flags are. Let's not yeah. do that again. That's good. Yeah. That's a, that's a good, that's a good moral. I think also, uh, Hey, collect uh, famous theologians to help you uh, out of terrible situations. Mm-hmm. And I say that half jokingly because uh, you've obviously done that, but I've done that as well. Like these people just an accident. I have a lot of awesome friends like you mm-hmm. and like all these people, um, which are great. And they'll give me advice. And uh, I guess that's another moral. Uh, have have good friends. Yeah. Yeah. If, you've, if you're fortunate enough to have a good group of people around you, yeah, pay attention to them, get their advice and figure out yeah. what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Well, uh, Ryan, this has been awesome. Thanks for sharing your, your terrible story and we can laugh about it. <laughs> you can laugh about it now. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for those who, who are just listening, uh, or who can't see our background, uh, it's ghost writer. Um, because this was the story of the almost ghost writer. Um, and I like to do weird stuff like that, but Ryan, how can people, uh, well, what do you got coming up next actually, uh, on the podcast for, for those listening? Yeah. So on the podcast, uh, the Reluctant Theologian podcast, we've got a few more episodes with Sam Liebens on the principles of Judaism. Uh, We're going to be looking at idealism uh, Mm -hmm. and his stuff on hyper time and the atonement. Um, Then I've got some some interviews on doctrine of God, um, God's love. And then uh, with uh, Anastasia Scrutton, she's going to be hosting a conference in Mm -hmm. Leeds coming up soon on mental health and Christianity. Okay. Uh, and so she's co- having me come out and I'm going to do some interviews with some of the speakers there. So I'm going to have some psychologists and some philosophers talking about mental health and Christianity. Nice. You guys, um, so, I mean, yeah. you have to talk about trauma, right? Like that's a big thing. Yeah. Like, so trauma is going to be one of the things. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, so there's a couple different interviews I'm going to be doing there. And then after that, I think I'm going to be doing a series of interviews with some of the people in Finland on cognitive science of religion um, and original sin. And then I'm going to try to line up some stuff on free will and foreknowledge as well. Oh, so there's sweet. a bunch of different kind of things for this year. This is huge, man. This is going to yeah. be awesome. Yeah. I, I meant to ask you about this too. Um, uh, I was talking with some of my friends and we were talking about how analytic stuff is in. Like, mm-hmm. that's cool. And I like it. And you're a big part of that. You, you're this world traveler. Uh, any plans for like continental folks? Like, is there still good continental theology and, and philosophy around? Or do we just uh, full out war against them and, and push them into... Um, there are a few people that I think are doing interesting work. They're the ones who they see like continental philosophy, uh, that it has a problem in terms of communication. <laughs> um, and so they figure out how to actually say things in a clear and coherent way. Mm-hmm. And, and I really like that. I really appreciate that. Um, the ones that are pushing into obscurity are the ones that just, they just keep coming with new jargon and it, it just trying to sound profound. And you're like, I eat. I, I don't know what you're saying and no, and none of your friends know what you're saying either. And right. they're all continental. So, it's, so there's a few different continental people who are like, yeah, like I'm going to try to speak clearly uh, and tell you what I think. And yeah. so we'll see. I don't, but I just don't know what's going to come of that. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. 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 I wonder, I usually, uh, I usually like the questions that they ask mm-hmm. and I usually I can't understand their answers a lot of times. Right. But then there's like someone like, it's like one of my, one of my acquaintances, like a Kate Kirkpatrick, like she's done stuff on like Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. Mm -hmm. And, and like, when I talk to her, I'm like, oh wow, that's the arguments they're running. Oh wow. Right. But I'm calling kind of like, why didn't they just say that? Like you're doing such a good job at explaining this. Like why, why can no one else explain this so well? Right. So you get some great people like her who's just like, yeah, I can tell you exactly what they're saying. Here's the arguments and here's here's the you know the reasons for justifying these premises and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's good stuff. Yeah, I, I look forward to, to finding more of that, especially, yeah, I just, I'm a huge Van Hooser fanboy mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, Van Hoos is pretty clearly like continental, but he, mm-hmm. he does pull a lot of the anal- analytic dudes and uh, yeah, he's like the one where I'm like, clearly van who's like that dude's awesome and he's yeah. great at what he does but i don't have a list and i want to if i'm if i'm a systematic yeah i want to yeah, have like here's here's top six guys or or gals that are working and, and they're doing great work that's understandable and it's not just design does sign and uh you know mm-hmm. you know the, just going the nothing, the nothing nuts yeah the nothing stuff, is yeah. nothing yeah right the yeah. Nuts. yeah okay well dude this has been huge thanks so much for um 
uh, for all your time and, and mm -hmm. your story. I'm so glad that God uh, saved you from that. Me too. And uh, dude, I, I love where you're at right now. It's 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 great. I, I don't think that you're a, a Heraclidian uh, and, and compromising <laughs> the doctrine of God or anything like that. But uh, man, appreciate your work. Do you have uh, what what's your? Do you have a paper coming out, or you have one that, that recently came out that, that people can find? Oh gosh, that's that's. A, I guess I've always got a million things coming out, so I don't know. I don't remember what just came out. Yeah. I think the most recent thing might have been um, this paper I did with uh, Larry Lavnan, uh, one of my colleagues in Helsinki, and it's on cognitive science of religion. And oh, uh, nice. so it's like, it, uh, like is classical theism implausible in light of cognitive science of religion? Yeah. Um, and then uh, Tyler McNabb and um, and Michael Devito, like they just yeah. wrote a response to it already. I didn't uh, know so that was a response. Yeah, they're coming yeah, on yeah, to yeah. talk about that, so I better read yours too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So like it's it was really cool. So it's already like I'm like it's it's not even published yet. It's already gotten a written response and everything. <laughs> That's awesome. uh, and so a bunch of my papers like that lately, they've just like I'm like this thing's still in forthcoming, and there's already yeah. got like three responses I'm being asked to review on. Yeah. Okay. I can't I can't keep up with this. So I can't even remember what all I've got coming out. Yeah. Uh, the next big thing though, like my book uh, from Divine Time Maker to Divine Watch is starting to come to an end so i'm, I'm oh, gonna nice. have a i've got this super top secret symposium um with a, a vip list of people who are going to give me feedback on it and then i'll try i'm to gonna write a response to that symposium and you'll, yeah write right a response now. to the symposium right now <laughs> uh and then i'll finish the book up and send yeah. it off to the publisher great yeah that, that's awesome I, I i love what you're doing man i seriously appreciate you and uh I love that uh, you're a Ted's guy. So I get to like kind of imagine like maybe someday I'll be like that as well. Um, so we'll see further, further down the line, but yeah, dude, thanks for your time. Thanks for your story and uh, keep tearing it up, man. It's been awesome. I'll try. I'll try. Awesome. Well, uh, this has been Parker's Pensies. You can find uh, a link to uh, Dr. Ryan Mullins's podcast and uh, some of his, his works as well in the show notes. So check that out. Um, if you like this episode, if you like this podcast, then please consider supporting again. Uh, you can find the link in the description, Patreon, and all that good stuff. That's going to have to do it for now, folks. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.